Hawaii is not immune to the fentanyl epidemic that is plaguing the country. Last year, the synthetic opioid killed a record number of people across the islands, according to the state health department, and it is only getting worse. It is a problem that affects a large cross-section of local residents and families. Join the conversation as we discuss the growing fentanyl crisis here at home, next on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lauren Day. Fentanyl is a power synthetic opioid that is 50 times more potent than heroin, and it's easier to access. This is a problem that affects every part of our state, from Hawaii Island to Kauai, and from Maui County to Honolulu. All islands have reported fentanyl-related deaths in 2022. And the problem is impacting every part of our society. Less than a year ago, a 14-year-old on Hawaii Island lost her life due to a fentanyl overdose. And synthetic opioid-related arrests continue to rise. So where are these drugs coming from? Why is fentanyl abuse on the rise? And what can we do about it? We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions. And you'll also find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and also on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. We have Heather Lusk, the executive director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. She has more than 30 years of experience working to reduce health disparities and stigma relating to chronic conditions linked to substance use. She is also a board member on Oahu's Homeless Coalition. Dr. Kevin Kunz is a physician in Kona on Hawaii Island. He helped to found a group called the American Board of Addiction Medicine, which led to addiction medicine being recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties. He received both his medical and public health degrees from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Kimo Alameda is a psychologist in Hilo on Hawaii Island. He is the head of the Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force, which distributes Narcan, a life-saving treatment that reverses the effects of an overdose. He also serves as the vice president of Hawaii Island Community Health Center. And for Ashley Rapp, this subject has, hits close to home. She tragically lost her son Joshua to a fentanyl-related overdose when he was only 18 years old just last year. She is also in recovery for substance abuse. Ashley, um, first of all, I'm so sorry. There's nothing that you know any of us can say to know what it feels like to be in your shoes. Um, as much as you are comfortable tonight, can you share a little bit about your son Joshua and tell us why it's so important for you to be here tonight and publicly speaking about it? Oh, my son was 18. He, <clears throat> he was, I mean, to me, just starting his life. But um, he decided to get into the wrong crowd. Um, he was drinking, partying a lot with other people and smoking weed and seeing it probably while he was growing up too with me losing, losing like not physically losing me, but losing me emotionally from drugs and from being in prison and things like that fed it, I believe fed the more of a finding of an acceptance in that scene. And um, I, I knew he partied, I knew he did all of that. And you know, it just tragically happened to her. Fentanyl came in and took his life. He was the most lovable, big teddy bear, big guy, laugh. Contagious laugh, and this fentanyl, like, is no joke. You know, like, they didn't have that stuff when I was growing up. Or maybe they did, but it wasn't as, as accessible. So it wasn't something that we, it was like, oh, let's try this, or let's, or I got to be scared if I'm going to smoke some weed if it's in there. You know, like, it, there's so much risk nowadays that it needs to be brought to light. There needs to be prevention. There needs to be things that get targeted because an 18 year old boy just starting his life and not gonna be able to live because 
this drug is out there on the streets and there's nobody, like nobody knows where it's coming from or they know how to prevent it or they know how to stop it, but like, it's still gonna happen. These kids are still gonna try this stuff. The kids are still gonna be like, it's there, he's okay, I'm gonna try it. And he, that person could be the unlucky one, you know? Cause he, there was another boy with my son that they both partook in it and he, somebody tried to save him with the Narcan, but it was too late, you know? and. That's not my story to tell, but he did pass away a week later, you know, and um, like it just goes to show like even sometimes if that Narcan isn't given fast enough, you're still not going to make it. You have to learn. You have to get educated. There's like steps and I this is like still real fresh for me. It's only been eight months, but I just like feel like this might be start of the process of healing because I have good days and I have bad days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it gets really empty and dark in those bad places. But I can tell you, like, honestly, the only thing that saves me is I have a one-year-old. So he saves me and I lean on God a lot. But I do still struggle majorly every day because I am in recovery. I don't want to go back to drugs. and. I, I'll just be real, real. Drinking, I still drink here and there to numb that, you know, to get through sometimes because it hurts. It hurts. There's such an emptiness. And so being able to share, like, my story or being able to give somebody else a little light of seeing how much or these kids to see, like, how much it affects somebody in their family. I mean, nobody's perfect because... I'm not, I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not, the next person isn't. There's always going to be some, there's always going to be where it could have not happened or, you know, like, or I don't want, I don't know, like not happen, but like, what if I did this mm -hmm. or what if I listened or like for me, it'd be like, okay, if I shared my story, Maybe I could have saved somebody. Yeah. Or if I shared, like, you know, you're not alone. Like, I've been there. Because there is that stigma, like we were talking about earlier. Like, there's that thing where people who are in recovery, some people who are in recovery, we don't want to share that, oh, I used to do drugs. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like, even at my job, none of them can believe that I did drugs because I don't look the type. Or I've been, you know, I've been through that because... It's the stigma. It's this certain kind of person is that person who does this and you're not, you can't be the person you are today because, yeah. you know, so there is hope to get out of it also. And I think the stigma is something that we're going to be talking about yeah. um, over the next, you know, 40, 50 minutes or so. <laughs> I'll see if someone can bring in maybe some Kleenex as well because I know, Ashley, we're probably going to be hearing from you a little bit more. Yeah. Um, Dr. Kunz, can you first tell us, first of all, what is fentanyl? And what does it do to the body? Fentanyl is in a class of drugs called opioids. Opioids go to the opioid receptor in the human brain. Most of us know that receptor because that's where endorphins would normally go. So if you're running a marathon or exercising or you're going to the prom, your endorphins get up and you feel good. By a coincidence of nature, the class of drugs opiates, whether they're by a prescription from a medical provider or from the street, they go to that same receptor. And so why run a marathon? Why get dressed up for the prom? Just get some opiates. So today, however, fentanyl being so powerful, a tiny little bit can kill. And really what we're seeing is people that don't know they're taking it, instances of young people smoking a cannabis joint that is laced with fentanyl that they didn't know. So this is a different group of people than those that have ongoing addiction, that they started using drugs or alcohol at a young age and just keep going for years and years and decades. So uh, these opiates, of which fentanyl is the strongest available, um, are dangerous. And even though we talk about methamphetamine being a bit the biggest problem, methamphetamine doesn't kill like fentanyl. 
Methamphetamine brings people into the police attention. It brings people to the emergency rooms. It's got a lot of ra-da-da around it. There's a lot of action, but it doesn't kill like fentanyl. And fentanyl is now killing our youth. Are there any legitimate medical reasons to use fentanyl for? Yes, almost everyone that's had a surgery probably gets a little fentanyl medically uh, for anesthesia or maybe for pain afterwards. Um, this is not the fentanyl that we see today in Hawaii. It is no longer diverted from the medical world because it's easy to get um, from illicitly made fentanyl that precursor substances come from China to Mexico. Mexico cooks it up and then it goes to the border and it's actually not migrants or Mexicans that are bringing it over the border. It's Americans that are bringing it over because there's an extremely high profit motive. So this is a completely different way of using fentanyl. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we hear about this crisis happening in major cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. You think of Hawaii, I think for most people it's paradise, especially for the folks that you know aren't from here, don't live here. Um, Kimo, can you paint the picture for us? How big of a problem is our fentanyl problem in, in, on the Big Island and also across the state? Sure. I mean, you know, one person every 11 days are dying uh, from an overdose, mostly associated with that drug, fentanyl. Uh, and it's growing. I mean, one person every 36 hours uh, is on our website, right, in the state is dying. But then just five days ago, we got to update our website now because it's one person every 27 hours in the state that's dying from an overdose, mostly associated with that drug, fentanyl. So it's, it's a problem. It, it is here. You know, and one thing I share with folks is, you know, the Pacific Ocean kind of separates us from the continent, so it gives us some time to kind of like prepare, because on the continent, it's, it's, it's really bad. Uh, but yet it's here, and now it's, it's growing, and it's growing very fast. So, the, you know, the alarm is up, and we should be concerned. Tell us about what the uh, Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force does and your role. Sure, so I'm the Fentanyl Task Force lead uh, on the island, our county is probably the only county in the state that has a task force um, that's addressing it from all angles. We meet uh, with the police department, the EMTs, we meet with treatment providers, we meet occasionally. We just had a summit last, last week. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, we have a strategic plan. And what we do is we, we, we try to combat this from two ways, right? There's uh, two ways to solve this problem. One is we gotta decrease the supply and we let the, the police and the Homeland Security, the FBI, you know, they're working hard at that and they're doing a good job. Um, but yet, you know, they only can tackle 15% of the, of the problem. Uh, still, there's 85% of the drugs that's still being uh, on our island. So then the second approach is to decrease the demand. And so that's prevention, that's education. And so we're out in the schools, we're doing training because we want the kids to know that, hey, you know, drugs make you feel good until they don't, right? And, and, and you can go from I like it to I want it to I need it. And when you're in I need it with any drug, now you're stuck. We call that addiction. And so getting the word out, I think prevention is, is super important and I think our island is doing a pretty good job at it. I think getting the word out is why all of you are here tonight as well, right? To get the word out and speak about it publicly. Heather, can you tell us about what the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction, um, what you all do and the work that you're doing to prevent fentanyl overdoses across the state. Yeah, so the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center works at the intersection of substance use, mental health, homelessness, chronic disease like HIV, and the criminal legal system. So we were involved in the Hawaii Opiate Initiative since it launched in 2017, and we're primarily uh, very responsible for helping get the Naloxone uh, uh, Act passed in 2016, Act 68. So this is an example of the naloxone that is um, provided by the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. And this is an amazing life-saving drug. We've distributed over 50,000 doses of this in Hawaii um, since uh, the beginning, of, since 2016. And this drug is so safe that the FDA just made it over the counter. So you'll start to see it over the counter, this particular brand, probably coming in July. Uh, it doesn't work on other substances, only works on opioids. So Dr. Kunz talked about the opioid receptors. This actually, if there's opioids in the, in the receptors, will bump them off and bind to the receptor to allow someone to start breathing again because stopping of breathing is the major risk mm -hmm. from an opioid-related overdose. So what you have in your hand right now, that is Narcan? Yes, this is Narcan. Uh, and again, you can 
um, carrying this, and the Surgeon General recommends that everybody carries this drug because what we're hearing is not just the people that you would think about or those that look like they use. We're seeing it across our age groups, um, and it's a very safe drug. You cannot misuse it. You don't get high from it. So there's, it's not a controlled substance. It will only have an impact if you have opioids in your system, mm -hmm. and that impact is you'll be able to breathe and and and, and stay alive. Um, and then if you have opioid dependence, it would put you into withdrawal um, because, again, the person's no longer having them. Um, but we encourage people to go to www.hhhrc.org. And if you do a 20-minute uh, training, we can send you naloxone in the mail. On Hawaii Island, encourage you to go to the Hawaii Island Community Health Center and with some of our other partners. Yeah. Who would you encourage to go to the site and try and get Narcan? Well, honestly, we've heard stories of Good Samaritans walking down the street and mm -hmm. using it. We know folks that have used it on their kapuna or family members. So we encourage any, everybody to have it because you'll never know. But particularly for anybody that um, has a, a history of substance use. We talked about young people, parents. Um, but again, it, it really can be for anybody because it's a very safe drug and there's no harm if you're not using opioids to use it. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? For sure, you know, we recommended that anybody who's on pain medication, I mean, we, we've been trying to get the pharmacies to be like, hey, if you give somebody pain medication, give them a free box of, of Narcan, mm -hmm. just in case. Uh, especially, you know, like with Kupuna, for example. Sometimes they forget if they took their two o'clock dose, they might double up at four o'clock and now they're in a situation. What's also <laughs> important to note is like with stimulants, um, you know, your heart's beating 200 times a minute, you know, and so at least you know something's wrong. Uh, but with, with an opioid overdose, you know, your heart just beats 60 beats a minute, then it goes to 50 beats, 30 beats. What happens is you think you're sleeping, but instead you're dying and you cannot save yourself. Uh, and that's why this is super important. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go to a viewer question somebody wrote in asking, um, this viewer doesn't understand the attraction of fentanyl and why people take it. Can someone please explain? Um, Ashley, maybe do you want to take this question? Um, I can like explain like <clears throat> why people do drugs. Period. I don't, I'm not too familiar with fentanyl, but the drugs, like for myself, I started taking it to numb, numb um, feelings. You know, like that we were talking earlier in the dressing room, and it's like it's linked to trauma, um, things that happen very that were very big, consequential. Um, it could be even your living environment. So for myself, it was too numb. And then it started to be like accepted because I first started, it was like, oh, I tried it, I liked it, and then I needed it. Mm -hmm. Like how he explained. It was, that was, that's where it went. And it's just, and then the party scene, and then you become into this other scene to where then, oh, I like it. So then now there's more feelings, there's more emotions there's excitement you know it feeds everything that you have that's like a hole in you it starts feeding that mm -hmm. so when people are like oh I don't understand why you do drugs it's because it feeds a an emptiness it feeds that place to where you either don't think about it mm -hmm. or you're giving like he said the endorphins it starts triggering endorphins to make you feel happy it starts to and just give you a sense of... And you're talking about belonging. drugs as a whole. Um, yeah, I, well, I've done ice, I've done cocaine and weed, so... And we're finding fentanyl in many of these drugs. Or, and I think that's the challenge, right, is that it's finding it in methamphetamine and ice. It's fo been found in cocaine in, in the islands. And so the part of the challenge is whether it's purposely put in there or whether it's cross-contamination, but we are seeing it in, in other substances as well. And at least for many folks, they're not trying to use fentanyl and maybe not realizing um, that that is what actually that's in the substance that they're taking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Kunz, you and I were talking right before we got started here, but a big problem is that people don't even know that maybe they take weed and it's laced with fentanyl, right? Well, that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing people that aren't aware that they're taking fentanyl. Um, and so that's a big problem because it's masquerading as every other drug that someone may use, whether it's in high school or whether it's a 40 or 50 year old. In fact, fentanyl is the leading cause of death in Americans 18 to 45 years old today in each of those age groups. I will say that that question is a good question. Why do people use drugs? Well, I think we have to get honest with ourselves and admit 
uh, that the cent one of the central defining features of the American culture is the use of drugs. And we can, now I'm not talking chocolate and coffee, but if you look at deaths in America, about one out of every four are caused by drugs. 3% of all deaths in America today are caused by overdoses. 3% by alcohol use disorder. 14% from nicotine, whether it be lung cancer or heart disease. And other drugs, including methamphetamine and prescription benzodiazepines. Also, when do you meet someone not taking something, whether it's at the liquor store or over the counter? It defines our culture, and it does give relief. And it gives relief to somebody who could be otherwise completely balanced and normal. It's a little bit of high, like a chocolate bar or a beer. But some people are more susceptible, either because they've had childhood or other trauma, and it fills the void, or just because genetically they're prone. So the truth is that may she rest in peace, but Mother Therese, Teresa, if she came to Kona 15 years ago, she could get addicted to methamphetamine and be walking the street. Um, these drugs are addictive. They kidnap the brain, and they're part of our culture. We just haven't seen anything as deadly as this mm -hmm. so quickly. Overdose deaths have been going up in America for 40 years. The curve is like a, a rocket. And we will never solve this problem with Narcan. We'll never solve this problem with treatment. We'll never treat our way out of this epidemic. We will never incarcerate our way out of it. We will never bury our way out of it. We've got to go upstream and think of prevention. And that starts with what's being happening here tonight. Education, prevention, awareness. And then we've got to make sure we fund treatment programs, that they're accessible, that they're culturally appropriate that we don't stigmatize drug use and the people that use drugs. And then we've got a shot at this. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I know you were telling me that you tried your best to make your son Joshua aware of your own experiences. Do you feel like this topic was discussed enough for you or even with Joshua? Um, for me, I'm pretty much programmed out, maybe with my son, even though we well, as myself drilled it into him, it probably still, that youthful still wanting to go out and experience his own is still, like, what? Because I'll tell you, I bet, I've beaten myself up how good of a person I wasn't. Because if I was a better mom, my son would still be here. If I nailed it into him, or if I brought him from Big Island to Oahu, when I had, when I started getting my life together, returning it around, if I brought him here, this wouldn't have happened. I don't know if it wouldn't have happened. And that's because down here on Oahu, it's worse than Big Island. They might have, it might be a little bit more accessible, but down here he would have got into another crowd, into another crowd, that's other drugs. You, you just don't know. And if he was educated, I think that I told him enough for him to make choices and like he, the even if he didn't know like I feel he didn't know I feel like though he smoked weed it, and it was lace or if they tried it and they thought it was something else but his toxicology spoke for it, it was, there's only weed fentanyl and mm -hmm. alcohol in his system and there's no way I feel like my son ever would have done fentanyl because this is right before, that's when the fentanyl started coming out. And it was me and my cousins all telling him, don't try to stay away, don't even do the coke. And because he was doing coke also before that, and he stopped all of it because we didn't know where they would be in. So feeling safe to smoke some weed is not safe anymore. Because mm -hmm. there was another boy, I think, maybe in the middle of October in Kona that smoked weed and died of fentanyl overdose. And that was just like, whoa, like, yeah. that's bad. How are they, how is it, it's gotta be dipped, sprinkled, something. There's some way it is. So even if I educated my son and he just smoked weed and that happened, there, it's still not, there's still not enough education and prevention. Right. It's, a, it's a big issue. You know, when, when that happened to your son, um, you know, to Joshua, that, that 
it blew our minds because I was presenting at the schools, right, and I was saying, hey, you know, nobody go from chocolate candy to fentanyl, right? There's usually one gateway situation happening. So yeah. alcohol, right, and then maybe they just smoke cigarettes, but nobody smokes cigarettes anymore. It's just vaping, right? So now they're vaping, but then after that, maybe they, like, smoke one joint. And when I heard that, oh, my gosh, fentanyl is now being laced in marijuana, that's a lot of kids that smoke in marijuana, you know. And so then I was like, my goodness, we really got to up the ante over here on, on, on prevention, you know. And, and these, these kids who are just experimenting, you know, so the parents got to be talking to their kids just like how we're talking to our kids. It's like, hey, like these drugs, even marijuana can be laced. And I'm hearing, uh, not to be alarmed, but, uh, you know, in, on the continent, fentanyl is being laced and found in the vaping devices now. So that makes it even worse. So I'm glad you guys put it on the show because people got to know this is dangerous stuff. How is this getting into our state? It's crazy. Um, okay, so they got, they got drug sniffing dogs, right? Thank goodness for these dogs. So they're, they're at the airports. They're doing a pretty good job there. They're at the, the barges and the, and the ports, so they're doing a pretty good job there. But, but it's just basically being, being flown in. Uh, through air, air mail, um, and and that's the biggest. So now they're they're the police is on it, right? So they're trying to figure out how to get these drug sniffing dogs at the post offices. But there's a lot of post offices, not enough drug sniffing dogs. So, you know, hence the problem. And do you feel that, you know, when like marijuana, for example, when it's being laced with fentanyl, that's being done on purpose or on accident? I, I don't know. Actually, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, well, first, when you look at, you know, all these pain medications, you go uh, ibuprofen, Tylenol, and then if you go to the doctor, they might give you Percocet, hydrocodone, oxycodone, you know, then Vicodin, you go dentist, they give you codeine, then you get morphine for surgery, then you get fentanyl. So, I mean, it, first of all, it was originally laced in, in, in pain pills, right? And I think that was on purpose uh, to get folks addicted. Um, and my guess, it is being laced in other drugs on purpose. Uh, one, because it's cheaper and it gives, gives uh, folks a bigger high and they get addicted quicker, mm -hmm. so. Heather, for you, you know, how strong do you feel the messaging is on social media already about the dangers of fentanyl and what can we do better? Yeah, you know, I think through the Hawaii Opiate Initiative, that started, as I think I mentioned, in 2017. and was actually started by Governor Green at the time. Um, uh, we've been able to get some social media pieces out there, but we need more. And I'm really grateful for folks like the Hawaii Fentanyl Task Force and, and other colleagues. There is, you know, more opioid-related dollars coming in. Now there's the opioid settlement dollars, which is, what, $78 million that's coming in. Hopefully some of that will go to not only prevention and treatment, but... Um, social media. Recently, there was uh, an, unfortunately an overdose death at a nightclub uh, in Honolulu that seemed to really get some attention. Um, in fact, uh, council member uh, Tyler DeSantos Tam has introduced a, a bill in the Honolulu City Council that will be getting heard next Wednesday that would require every nightclub on the island to have naloxone because of this and and other um, examples that we've seen from the continent. So we are getting more awareness out there, but it's really you know, more talking about it, break the stigma, break the silence, uh, because by talking, we can save a life. And I, I, I really related to you, Ashley, when back when I did experimentation, there wasn't something that would kill you that first time or not anywhere near as likely. And now the first time someone tries something, if it has fentanyl in it, they could die. And that is just such a scary, um, message and at the same time we don't want to scare people we want to help have dialogue. Mm. Can you also tell us a little bit about that new law that's on the governor's desk right now um, to decriminalize fentanyl testing strips? Yeah so um, Senator San Buenaventura actually thanks to Dr. Kimo <laughs> over here um, put an SB 671 which was unanimously um, um, passed by both the House and the Senate bipartisan um, and it's on the governor's desk, and what it would do is decriminalize uh, fentanyl test strips. So these are test strips that um, are typically made for like urine drug screens. Um, so like a little piece of paper that you would dip in with a little bit of water and whatever the drug was. And if fentanyl was in it, it would show a line. Um, but because it's considered paraphernalia in the state, um, it would that's, they're considered illegal until the governor signs um, SB 671. Um, Dr. Kunz, you know, when you see this this topic being discussed on the national media, what would you like to say that maybe isn't shared as predominantly? Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, first, if I could just comment on fentanyl being laced in marijuana. Um, make no mistake, 
the selling of fentanyl as a product is a business to make money. It's not like somebody's baking brownies and it just so happens that some Pacalolo fell in the brownies and you got marijuana brownies. This fentanyl is where it is because somebody's making a dollar. In fact, they're making a lot of dollar. So that's part of who the terrorism is. But we will never get them all. We catch one today, there'll be another tomorrow dealing. That will not stop. We've got to do, as Dr. Kimo says, decrease demand. I think one of the things that I think we've been touched with on the Big Island is that we've all hear these statistics. And when we had our conference last week, and our task force has been going for over 18 months now. And it started when we lost a 14-year-old in Kona with a fentanyl overdose. Died on TikTok. Mm. So that was a wake-up call. But what we see is the statistics, they get on the news, the drugs that are confiscated get on the news, the 320 deaths last year from overdoses get on the news. But what we see in our community is the folks, the families, the people in recovery, the healthcare workers, the social workers, the treatment programs that are seeing this day in and day out. Um, this moves their heart. We call them the boots on the ground. Those are the people that are not the statistic people. They're the people that are living with this. And it affects not only the person that's using or dying, it affects their family, it affects everyone who knows them, it affects our community. And it's putting rain's acid on the soul of our community. And the only way we feel we can change on the Big Island is if we all work together. And that's what this task force has been about. And I hope we can keep going. We need a lot of resources there. We talk about demand reduction. Uh, there's not enough providers. There's not enough treatment beds. We don't even have a place where someone can have a social detoxification and a safe bed on the Big Island. We have to send people to Oahu. It takes a week or two. And if you have this disease, you don't wait a week or two. So we lose them. So um, I think we have to look at the heart side, not just the statistics. We have to say, what is this doing to us? And it's certainly, as we saw last week, it impacts the caregivers and those trying to make a difference. It impacts the families. Um, we have to come together for this and not just be about statistics. You see this firsthand. How hard is it for someone who is addicted to synthetic opioids to stop once they get addicted? Well, it's very difficult. It's always been very difficult. And it's almost impossible with fentanyl to stop. In fact, if they could just stop, that wouldn't be addiction. And so, however, and we should mention this, that we have FDA-approved medications that'll take away the craving and it'll take away the withdrawal from fentanyl and other opiates. This is routinely done now in the emergency room in Kona and at several clinics on the Big Island. So if someone using can come in and walk out two hours later, not high, not in withdrawal, and not craving for more. That medication is buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone. Recently, the government took away all restrictions for its prescription. And nevertheless, it's hard to find providers who will give it to a patient. As was mentioned, I think, when we were talking earlier, uh, providers go, oh, I don't really take care of those patients, those people. Um, the truth is they could save a lot of lives and they could make a lot of lives better. So this medication is available now and should be used. That's really good. I can piggyback on that because uh, you're kind of talking about the stigma, right? So the stigma of addiction is pretty heavy uh, in, in, in the state. And, uh, and we're trying to change words even, like substance abuse. You know, we try to use the word substance use. Um, and, you know, addictions being a brain disease, um, just like heart disease. You know, nobody chooses heart disease. Nobody chooses diabetes. Um, similarly, nobody chooses addiction. You know, and we don't know when our brain go from not being addicted to addiction. That's why experimentation is dangerous. Just like heart disease, you don't know when you're, you go from not having heart disease to heart disease. Um, so if we start to look at it as an addiction, as a, as a, as a brain disease, I mean, then, then that might help shift it a little, mm -hmm. you know. Heather, you know, we've been talking about Narcan with you. Um, Naomi from Mililani is asking, why can't people just pick up Narcan at the pharmacy? So you can in Hawaii, pharmacists under Act 154 are allowed to prescribe naloxone at the pharmacy. The challenge, unfortunately, is really the cost. And while it is covered by insurance, there's still a copay. 
So one thing we're waiting, as I mentioned, this 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 life saving drug will be over the counter this summer. This berry one, the nasal one that you put into the um, nostril, and we're all waiting to see what that price will be. Um, right now, the shelf price for this is seventy five dollars per dose. So I think we're really hoping for a more reasonable cost. Um, mm -hmm. So people can get it from their local pharmacy. In fact, if you go to hawaiiopioid.org, we have a map that shows you every place in Hawaii where you can get naloxone. Mm -hmm. This is a follow-up question from one of our viewers as well on the topic of Narcan. Um, this person saying, I sense a reluctance by the police and the community to discuss the fentanyl problem. How can we encourage people to carry Narcan and take this more seriously? Yeah, such a, such a good question. I will say that our law enforcement partners, I think have been alongside us, don't you mm -hmm. agree, Dr. Kimo, that we've been, um, so most every law enforcement or every county police does carry naloxone um, in this state. Um, I believe the sheriffs do as well, and uh, many of our folks, uh, some of our main partners in law enforcement really understand that we cannot arrest our way out of this crisis. At the same time, um, there's still stigma related. So, for example, so, um, I've heard people being, wor being worried that if they know I have naloxone, that it might affect my life insurance policy because it means I am at risk. Or if somebody finds this and they're going to think that I'm a drug user. So mostly, again, we hear about the stigma related to it. Um, but this lasts about two years, um, so it has a pretty long shelf life. It can last um, uh, uh, over 100 degrees for a few moments. So it's a really stable um, substance that people can carry around with them. We just say don't leave it in your car because um, that might make it not um, as effective. So again, keeping talking about it. And so hopefully we'll continue to be able to see people not only carrying it, but talking about it and distributing it to folks that may need it. Mm -hmm. Kimo, I think maybe you can take this question yeah. from a viewer on Maui. If fentanyl kills so surely, why is it so popular to use to lace with drugs? Dealers profit off of people using their supply, especially repeat buyers. There's nothing to profit if there are no more buyers. Yeah, that's true. So people ask the question, why would the dealer want to kill their customers, right? So it's crazy. I mean, in the drug world, first of all, if, if you have an addiction, number one, you're not going to think it's you you know, you think you're invincible. Um, and number two, the withdrawals is so strong, um, you know, that somebody who's going through the withdrawals, they just want to get that withdrawals off. I mean, it's it's like almost suicidal. Um, you know, it, it's like, I mean, you, when you hear people who are stuck uh, in withdrawals, they tell you it's like the worst thing. So they want to make sure that whatever they're taking and they don't have too much money, they want to get a biggest bang for their buck. They want to make sure it works. So, yeah, and, and the craziness as well is in the drug world, um, when the word gets out that that pain medication or that that drug is is powerful and they're getting it from that person, believe it or not, you think that drug dealer will be less popular. They actually become more popular. Mm. So that makes it even harder. Yeah, Dr. Kunz, you were saying this is a business at the end of the day for these drug dealers. Uh, Mark and Kailua is asking, do teenagers even know about this? How do we get the word out? <laughs> well. Uh, I got to give credit to my colleague, Dr. Kimo Alameda here. He's given over 300 presentations on the Big Island schools, at clubs, at churches, at gatherings of every sort. So we've done, if that was done everywhere, and, and schools keep inviting back. So the education is, is really super, super important. And, but it's only one step. Um, there's active prevention things that can go in place at every level. For instance, we know that just screening, asking a question of your child or in a school or healthcare setting, screening and asking if you use, if they're using anything, do a very brief intervention, which sometime, sometimes can change the trajectory of that individual's life. And if they have a problem, a referral to treatment. So uh, I think the word is getting out. It needs to be much louder, but we have to follow it up so that when people say, I need some help, we've got help there to give them. Right now, we don't. Yeah. We're short-staffed on, every, on everything that has to do with helping somebody with addiction. It's the disease America doesn't want to have and hasn't been treating. Um, and, and I just, because it came up earlier, two things. One, suicide. The epidemic of suicide is linked to substances. 40% yeah. of suicides somehow involve opiates, fentanyl, or other drugs. And that's gone up through the pandemic. So when we see youth suicides, and we've seen this in our own community, oftentimes involving fentanyl or other drugs. Um, so that's, that's really important. I, I can tell you that when we talk about people didn't mean to get heart disease or diabetes, in 30 years I've treated thousands of people with addiction. I've never, never met a single one who said, my intention when I started was to ruin my life 
get off balance and hurt the people that I love the most. So this disease sneaks up on you and um, we have to sneak up on it and hit it with a big sledgehammer. And the only way we're gonna do that is not just trying to stop the flow of drugs in, but the major way will be doing education and having treatment available for people that want it, ready when they want it. Can I just, I want to just note that even though we don't have treatment on demand, which I think is what the idea would be, right, mm -hmm. doctor, that somebody says, I want treatment and that day or very soon they yeah. get access to, we do now have a 24 hour line called the CARES line. Um, and you can also access it through 988. It's the same line that's a suicide, the suicide prevention line. And you can call and if it's someone you're worried about, it's your family member, if you yourself, and you can learn about how to access treatment through that line. And it's called the CARES line. You can get it through 988 or 832-3100. And there are folks that you can talk to, again, 24 hours a day, whether it's a crisis or, again, getting substance use help. The challenge, though, that is it can be, I don't know what it is on Hawaii Island, but here, several weeks to several months, especially if you want residential um, yeah. treatment to get the support that you deserve. So um, we're so grateful that we do have the medication at H3RC. We provide almost 300 p folks with buprenorphine and we've just seen it change people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's a treatment like you would for insulin and you wouldn't, you wouldn't call insulin a, you know, a, a medications for diabetes disorder, right doctor? And yet we call that for medications, oftentimes they're called medications assisted treatment when the treatment is a treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Let me add to, you know, so parents, right, for the parents out there, coaches, you know, for the pastors. I mean, we don't have enough psychologists, and it was mentioned, uh, therapists to go around. But, you know, um, talking to our kids, I have seven of them, you know, and I talk to them all the time. And don't be afraid to be an egg, right? You just got to keep reminding them that, you know, first of all, their brain's not fully developed until age, like, 25. And so you're going to start mixing substances in there when your brain's still trying to figure itself out. I mean, 90% of all addictions happen before the age of 20. So, you know, if, if our kids can postpone experimentation to 25, uh, then the, the chances of their addiction drop significantly. And so I always tell my kids, hey, if you hang around with three vapors, you're going to be the fourth, right? So also they got to use good judgment and, and, and who they hang around and who they circle themselves with, yeah. Chemo, that's a good segue to this viewer question via email. Um, this viewer says, I'm a teacher on the Big Island. How do we know if one of our students is using and how do they behave? Yeah, so with opioids, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a downer, right? So sleeping, maybe nodding off, um, maybe behavior start to change. Mm -hmm. And with all drugs, there's some telltale signs, right? Priorities become secondary. Um, because once you get that addiction, uh, everything else becomes secondary to that addiction. So the grades might drop, uh, they might be sleeping less, they might be sleep, might be not, not sleeping at all, depending what the type of the drug. So any change in behavior um, in the classroom, you know, grades, uh, maybe they're not as interactive. Uh, when you see something that's different, I'll just start having the discussion already. Mm -hmm. Um, Ashley, I want to go back to you. I wanted to follow up. I know earlier Dr. Kunz was talking about, we've all been talking about, um, you know, resources, how to get help. Um, I know what he said probably really resonated with you. Um, what for you worked to kind of, you know, get yourself stepping towards being in recovery? For me, it was seeing my son going down that road and me wanting to lead by example. I've done all the programs. I've done programs in prison. I've done programs out here. And honestly, it helped, but it didn't help enough for me to stop or want to change. I think um, there's one thing that resonated for me. I went to Staten Island was that it's a mindset. After you get the knowledge into you about addiction and how it, you get addicted, it's now changing that mindset to wanting to change your life to lead a different way or to go back to what is so-called normal, mm -hmm. you know, or like um, getting yourself out of the hole. So it was the mindset of wanting to lead by example for my child that I wasn't there for. And it was just being tired, tired of living the same thing, the same door it was it's just the what do they call it when we go you some kind of door like revolving. it just revolving, revolving door. door yep the revolving door and then, and then to set on what he said about 
resources and treatments and things like that and how they were saying it does take months before you can get into a treatment program and even for women it's even harder mm. and that's why like you see a lot of the women in prison they sit in prison because there's not enough treatment programs there's not enough clean and sober houses for them mm. to get out to there's none there's not enough resources and because when it really happens, addiction falls right back into you getting incarcerated because then you do crime to get your next fix. And then to get out of it, it takes a lot mm -hmm. because you got to start paddling upwards. And when you paddle upwards, you get knocked down because there's not enough. There's not enough treatments. There's not enough resources for them to live at, to get help. So, I mean, it takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of resilience, and a lot of just holding on yeah. and going because you will make it out. I mean, yeah, we, 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 we use an acronym. It's called HOPE. We got this from our, one of our friends in recovery, and he said uh, he uses this. And so HOPE is hold on, pain ends. And if folks who are struggling with addictions can, can just hold on, uh, and stay alive, and that's why Narcan is super important. Fentanyl test strips would be super important too. You know, the, the, the treatment may come in, in, in different ways. And right now, the, the best treatment uh, for opioid addiction is Suboxone or buprenorphine and a support group, uh, NAAA and such like such. So, you know, I would say go look for those um, and, and get yourself on that road to recovery. I, I would confirm that, that we say together is better. Get a medication, but have your support group and keep learning. And uh, it just seems that maybe I should say, you, we can't see the brain that's sick in this disease. But if I fall off a cliff hiking next week and I broke 10 bones in my pelvis and fell in the water and I got a pneumonia, I'd be in the hospital and rehab for a long time, but I would come back. But with the disease of addiction, we expect people to just stop. That doesn't happen. This is a chronic disease and it takes a while. Um, it takes steps at a time. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the signs of preventing fentanyl overdose. This is actually a question from one of our viewers. I'll open it up and, and any of you can take the question. Are there any early signs to watch for to prevent a fentanyl overdose? Shortness of breath, anything like that, any sort of symptoms? It's, so yeah, there are, there are a few. So uh, one is that the, the breathing slows. I mean, you heard it because the heart rate is slowing, so the breathing can slow. We're talking typically, if it gets down to 10 breaths or less a minute, then that person is really is really struggling. And so you might also start to see the lack of oxygen in their, um, depending on their natural tone, you may see that in their nail beds or in their lips, that they're starting to get blue or purple because, again, the oxygen is not getting to where it needs to be. So those are a couple. And then he mentioned the, the nod, mm -hmm. which could be somebody going like this. Um, what we recommend is doing what's called a sternum rub, where you take your, your fist like this and rub right here. Even that hurts a little bit. And if somebody responds to that, most likely they don't need naloxone. They may need to still be watched. But if they don't respond, again, there's no harm in doing this. We don't don't want to um, issue other basic life-saving skills or calling 911, but those are some of the things that I'd love to hear from doctor if there's other signs that we could uh, indicate to look for. Of, of course, the irony is that people can use drugs, whether it's alcohol, nicotine, or opioids, and not be noticed by other people. But eventually, they will lose control, and if they take too much opiates, they'll get lethargic, they'll slow down, they won't be talkative, their eyes may start closing, they nod, um, they don't have their energy. They're happy sometimes until they go down all the way. So as, as opposed to methamphetamine where you speed up, big okay. difference. You know, Narcan, the statistics is, is pretty profound. I mean, so on the big island, one person every 11 days are dying, right, from an overdose mostly associated with fentanyl. Um, but the EMTs tell us that, you know, for three people, every 10 calls are being saved uh, from, from Narcan. Uh, so, so that's amazing. And it works right away, right? I mean, we're talking within two minutes. And, and, yeah, and in fact, it's part of the protocol now. For an EMT, they do two things become standard procedure. One is they give them sugar, that somebody's who un unresponsive, and then they give them Narcan while they're setting up the, the equipment for CPR. And people are, three out of ten, are coming right back to life because of that. I have a question. That. Can it ever be instantaneous, like where it just, like, they inhale or they mm -hmm. do the yeah. fentanyl yes. and they just, yes. mm -hmm. like that? It, it cuts off the respiratory center in the brain. It's overloaded, 
and the heart rate's going down, but really it's breathing that kills people with this. It knocks that center out in the brain stem and they can't breathe and it can happen instantly. Wow. And then with, since fentanyl is so potent, as you mentioned, sometimes it may take more than one dose. And we're, we are, we've had at least one participant who said it took four doses wow. um, before the person responded. So most kits come with two. Um, and we are working with the health department to get vending machines out into the community. We just ordered 20 of them um, to go across all the islands where then there can be more public places for people to get access mm -hmm. to this life-saving medication. And, and a big thing is happening on the East Coast in Massachusetts. The ambulances and the police that have been carrying Narcan for a long time, one of the first in the country. Now when they have somebody with an overdose, as soon as they come out of the overdose, they offer them buprenorphine, Suboxone, because they'll be in withdrawal and they can get started right there. Hopefully they don't have to go that far. Hopefully when their health provider or their family or the teacher says you've got a problem and get them on a medication that will help them. And then they can slowly wean off that or move on with their life. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, I know a big thing that all of you wanted to share was the stigma around this fentanyl problem in our state. Um, what can we do moving forward to tackle that problem? I'll let anyone, mm -hmm. anyone answer that. Sure, well, first we can be careful with our words. You know, we try to stay away from addicts or somebody who, you know, is now clean because the opposite of what it was dirty, you know. So, you know, person in recovery is, is better language, so be careful with the, the language that, that we use. I mean, you know, we, we say substance abuse, but really um, it's substance use. I mean, s somebody with heart disease, we don't say, hey, you Big Mac abuser, you, <laughs> right? So, right, so again, the, the words we use got, got to change. So I would say start there. And just talk about it. Um, again, just break the silence around it. I'm so, I mean, I'm so, you're so courageous, Ashley. Thank you for just showing that again, that there's no shame in the recovery road that you've been in. Yeah. And by that's what we need to do more of is really have that conversation. The other one I wanted to mention is one group of people that are at higher risk of overdose are people that are in recovery that relapse. Um, because oftentimes when people are opioid dependent, they go into recovery, they think that they can take a higher dose because yeah. we build a tolerance over time. And yet relapse, right, doctor, is sometimes a, a, an expected part of the cycle and yet and yet if we don't talk about relapse prevention and give naloxone to folks that are, are in recovery then they might be shamed or hide it and that's where we see people die because they're so so ashamed about the relapse and yet they're at higher risk of getting it addiction is a chronic disease just like diabetes or heart disease or asthma and you've got to watch it all your life and sometimes it can recur yeah um, we do have a Facebook comment from Charlene that I want to make sure I read. Uh, Charlene says, Mahalo Heather and Chemo for all you are doing to help save lives. And I know our other viewers as well. I want to thank uh, Dr. Kunz and also Ashley for just being so brave. You know, Ashley, I've seen you nodding throughout the last hour to everything our other panelists have said um, because you've lived this firsthand yourself and now you're lost, just so beyond words. I'll give the last question to you if you don't mind answering. Um, what message do you have for other parents out there and also other people that are in your shoes or were in your shoes uh, struggling? Um, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I just think that by me actually stepping out and talking about it now, like, cause because of the stigma, because for myself, because of the stigma, it's, you don't ever talk about doing drugs, you know, or you, like you being addicted like that. It's more of a recreational party. I, I, I party, I go out and I do a line of coke, you know, that's the, that's the extent of a conversation about drugs, not being addicted in some kind of alleyway smoking, you know what I mean? Or sitting on a sidewall on the wall drinking your beer, thinking you're cool because you're all high, but you're trying to come down. You know, there's hope. Like, I've been there, and now, like, I live a fully functional life, you know? Like, um, I'm drug-free. I, I have a new one-year-old. I have a full-time job that I can't. I go to school. You know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And then for the people who have loved ones who they lost, it's never gonna go away, but it's the way you deal with it. You know, there's good days, there's bad days. I have a lot of bad days. And I think this is finally one step for me healing in that area, is talking and 
because even that I was kind of closed off about it. I was like, I'm not ready to talk. I don't want to do it. I, you know, I went through those whole two weeks when first I got called, I was like, I only wrote my bio to come here, but I said, you know what? I got to do it, mm -hmm. you know? And if you can find a higher power for you, that's the best thing to lean on. And that's just out of my experience. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being so brave and willing to share. Just a few seconds left. Any last words? We started with Joshua. How would you like him to be remembered? Um, just as a lovable teddy bear that wanted to have fun and I give some kind of hope and let him be an inspiration for other kids to just like, don't do it. It's not worth it to try experiment. Yeah. It's not anymore. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for sharing, and thank you to all of our panelists tonight. And of course, we want to give a big mahalo for all of our viewers who are tuning in. Of course, thanking our guests, Heather Lusk, the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, Kimo Alameda, the head of the Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force, physician Dr. Kevin Kunz, who is also on the Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force, and Ashley Rapp, who lost her son to a fentanyl overdose. Next week, we will be taking a break from Insights for a special Kako, Hawaii's Town Hall, all about the up-and-coming generation. Many of Hawaii's youth are leaving our shores for education and employment prospects on the mainland. Join us for Kako, where young people will try and answer the question, should I stay or should I go? I'm Lauren Day for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.